Hello, I'm Ted Pike. Every year, thousands of pilgrims come to this place, Palestine, to discover their spiritual roots. Yet today, it is not just the religious. Mankind in general is turning its attention toward this land. Most of us realize that if World War III erupts, it could begin right here in a collision between Arab and Jew. What are the causes of this conflict between Arab and Jew, a conflict which never seems to go away? Before Zionist settlers came here around the turn of the century, this region was not particularly known for strife. Yet since then, it has known little but strife. Is there something within Judaism itself which acts as an abrasive on this land? To answer that question, we don't need to make another pilgrimage to Palestine. We don't need to visit historic sites or Jewish shrines. Instead, since Judaism is very much a religion of its literature, we need to go where its most sacred teachings are preserved. We need to go to a synagogue, in particular, the library of a synagogue. In every synagogue library, we find hundreds of books, but there are a few which tower above the rest in authority. These include the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, the Jewish Encyclopedia. In the oldest of these, the Jewish Encyclopedia, we encounter fascinating new perspectives on the inner teachings of Judaism, perspectives which are well known to most religious Jews, but unknown to Christians. Most Christians believe that the Judaism of the Old Testament is very similar to Judaism today. Yet the Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on Judaism, says modern Judaism and the Judaism of the Old Testament are very different. It says that after Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah in the 6th century BC and led the Jews to distant Babylon, the Jews were faced with challenges to their faith they had never before experienced. Ever since the time of Solomon, the religion of Israel had centered around the magnificent temple in Jerusalem with its sacrifices and ritual. The question now became, how could one be a true Jew in a very foreign, even hostile environment? The need arose for a certain class of lay priests called scribes or sophurim to interpret the law in this new setting and make it workable. In time, these scribes became what the New Testament calls the scribes and Pharisees, the greatest legal authorities of Israel for all ages. The Pharisees said there were really two inspired revelations to the Jews. There was the written law of Moses received atop Sinai, but there was also the oral tradition acquired by 70 elders who came to the base of the mountain but were forbidden to proceed farther. The Pharisees said that these 70 elders, or Sanhedrin, received a much more extensive and profound revelation than Moses, a revelation which was never written down, yet took precedent over the written law. When Jesus came on the scene, his reaction was to bitterly denounce this counterfeit tradition. Christ said the Pharisees, by their tradition, had made the law of God of none effect. He considered the Pharisees the most dangerous leadership Israel ever had. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Although Jewish sects such as the Sadducees now disappeared, the Pharisees emerged with even greater power over the Jewish people. The Jewish Encyclopedia describes the new role of the Pharisees. With the destruction of the temple, the Sadducees disappeared altogether, leaving the regulation of all Jewish affairs in the hands of the Pharisees. Henceforth, Jewish life was regulated by the Pharisees. The whole history of Judaism was reconstructed from the Pharisaic point of view. Pharisaism shaped the character of Judaism and the life and thought of the Jew for all of the future. In 135 AD, all Jews were expelled from Palestine. The Pharisees led most Palestinian Jews in a mass migration back to Babylon. The majority of Jews were already in Babylon and had been since the time of Nebuchadnezzar 600 years earlier. Yet around 140 AD, Babylon became the acknowledged land of refuge for world Jewry. For another thousand years, Judaism flourished in Babylon under the leadership of the Pharisees. Great academies of the rabbis were established and thousands of new laws formulated. There, those same Pharisees who killed Jesus Christ 
remained the undisputed rulers of Judaism. In Babylon, the Pharisees codified their oral traditions into the Babylonian Talmud, the written form of that oral tradition which Jesus so bitterly rebuked. The Talmud reveals how deep was Israel's apostasy. In her beginning, God gave the Hebrews the loftiest, the most upright literature and ethics the world has ever known. Yet when they turned their backs on him, they produced the Talmud, a work which has aptly been called a monument to human folly. The Talmud also helps us understand the basis for Christ's unflattering descriptions of the Pharisees. Jesus described the Pharisees as hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. He even described the Pharisees as children of their father the devil, a murderer from the beginning. The Talmud confirms Christ's words. In the Talmud, in Treatise Sanhedrin, an extensive passage describes the right of the Pharisee to kill anyone, just as long as he did so indirectly. As one of dozens of examples, the Talmud tells us that if one bound his neighbor and he died of starvation, he is not liable to execution. In such an indirect manner, the Pharisees also killed Christ. Manipulating the Romans to actually wield the spear and sword, the Pharisees claimed, as their descendants do today, that since the Romans were the direct cause of the death of Christ, it is the Romans, not the Jews, who are guilty. Christ also called the Pharisees adulterers, an adulterous generation. The Talmud provides generous loopholes for adultery. It says the penalty for adultery does not include sex with a minor, the wife of a minor, or the wife of a heathen. The Talmud also encourages seduction of unwed adolescent girls called designated bondmaids. But it's important how such rapes are performed. With the designated bondmaid, one is guilty only in the case of natural connection, but not in the case of perverse connection. The Pharisees reason that rape in a perverted manner is outside the jurisdiction of the law. Normal rape, however, was punishable. In Babylon, sexual perversion of every kind had been a way of life for millenniums. The Pharisees were deeply influenced by such practices. In three of the major treatises of the Talmud are found extensive passages which give legal endorsement to seduce and marry three-year-old baby girls. In fact, many of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, including Simeon ben Yohai, upheld this privilege. Today in Israel, thousands of Jews go to Meron every year to venerate the memory of Simeon ben Yohai, one of the most respected rabbis in the history of Judaism. In one of dozens of endorsements of child sex, Simeon ben Yohai said, A proselyte under the age of three years and a day is permitted to marry a priest. Agreeing with ben Yohai, the great rabbi said, When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. For when the girl is less than this, three years and a day, it is as if one put the finger into the eye. The footnote to this passage says, As tears come to the eye again and again, so does virginity come back to the little girl under three years. The same section confirms that sexual activity with small boys is in the same category. The intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. 